going to be introducing uh, two people for you today that you've come here to see. Um, Alan Steinfeld of New Realities is going to be interviewing Helen Kramer. Alan is someone I've gotten to know recently. Helen first told me about him as a cultural icon. Um, he's got his New Reality TV show on Manhattan Table. And um, he also has a very popular uh, YouTube channel. I guess you did not know. Um, thousands and thousands of people subscribe. I think there's like 40,000 subscribers. 50,000. 50,000 now. Yeah. And there's been millions of views on the content that he has put out there. Um, so I, like I said, I met Alan through Helen. And Helen is someone um, that I have had the privilege to get to know over the years. And I'm so excited to be introducing him to you today. Um, Helen and I met when, at the time, I was working as an entrepreneur and I was feeling stuck and I wasn't sure what to do with my company. And a friend of mine said, you know, I think you should talk to Helen Kramer. You know, she is a therapist, but she works on, she's a business consultant, and I just really think I have a feeling we would get along and, and she can help you figure this out. So I had one phone conversation with Helen initially and I said to her, I said, well, I've, I've done a lot of therapy. Um, I've done my deep, dark work. I've studied with people for years. I said, I, I don't know if there's anything that you can do that would really help me. And something about the conversation just struck me and inspired me, and I went to see Helen. And I told Helen that my first session with her was like five years of therapy. Um, we moved very quickly. We moved very deeply, and I discovered a lot of things and proceeded to study with her over the years. Um, and cannot tell you enough how much, how transformed I feel and, and how every session with her I've had has had an impact on me um, from figuring out what to do with my company and moving me through that in business, um, relationships, life, learning about empathy, compassion, relationships, like I said, um, learning the triggers, which I know Helen is going to be talking about today. And, you know, it's been such a gift to me to work with her. And so recently, I've started to support her in sharing her story and getting it out there. And so it's been just such an honor that this woman who has taught me so much over the years that now I can support her with something and give back. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Alan to introduce Helen and interview her about him. Thank you very much. It is great to be at the assemblage. I think this is a new way of um, activating community because um, it's taken the old model and really upgraded it. So I just love being here. Last time I was here, I was interviewing Deepak Chopra and that was a huge success. So I'm happy to be back here as much as possible. And especially with someone like Helen Kramer, who I've interviewed about four or five times, the first time about 10 years ago. And Helen has so much insight into the way we humans relate to each other and how we get stuck in these patterns. And she knows this because she's worked through it herself. She's woken up to her own happiness and it's not dependent on anyone else. That's what I love about her. So today's subject was called phantom emotions and we'll get into what that means. But I think to set the groundwork, we should talk about, you know, in a way, your, your experience, what, how do you understand, what are we here for, Helen? What, what, tell, tell us. Okay, I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> We're here for liberation. We're here to end suffering. Um, we're here to enhance every part of our lives. And um, I always called myself my own guinea pig. So I am so absolutely grateful mm. that I've been giving, given the tools for this kind of liberation. And um, all I want to do is pass those tools on because, um, you know, when, when um, Marissa was saying she was honored to be able to help me, she ha it was reciprocal all the way through. I right. never needed anything back because the joy of seeing somebody's liberation and they're mm. coming into their own I, I've said to um, a couple that I saw recently, and we had a very 
loving session, and I said, this, this is what is called my work. There's no work involved. Mm -hmm. It's just a labor of love, so I'm happy to be here. So let's get into the tools, and then we'll talk about phantom mushrooms. But uh, why do people suffer? That's really everyone's question. Why are we in relationships? We're in relationships to be happy, to love that one, have be loved. It's like, why? What? How, how okay. come? <laughs> well, the first, I do a lot of workshops on relationships, and I always say to people, if you want to attain or maintain intimacy, the first relationship that needs shifting is your relationship to yourself. Right. Um, because we're always looking outside, because nobody teaches us. We, we live in an unsophisticated culture that didn't understand how human beings operate. Mm -hmm. And so as a person who had a lot of love mm -hmm. growing up, I, I, that led me to feel optimistic and see people in a positive way. So I made a um, career out of studying what gets in our way? What? I believe everybody wants to be happy, everybody wants to be joyful, everybody wants to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I don't call myself a psychotherapist except when I'm signing insurance forms. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's in our way? Okay, well, what's in our way is that we have a brain that is wired for fear. All living creatures are wired to have a quick fight, flight, or freeze response that's how species survive. So when I first started my practice after my training, and I was taught about people being regressive and, and self-sabotaging and masochistic, and one day I'm looking across the room and I see somebody and wow, I had an insight. And I said, here's something in the brain. This is a, a person who's working very hard. They're spending their money coming here. They're not sabotaging themselves. They don't. They're not in love with their suffering. Right. So I intuited something, not knowing anything about the brain, that we have this fight, flight, or freeze part of our brain. That's the part of our brain that we use when we're young children, because our our neocortex takes over 20 years <laughs> to fully d develop. So what I intuited, and then um, it was proven to be correct, is that. We were meant to survive, okay? Now, how many people on a, on a regular basis are in mortal danger? No, we're not. Few, and not in our culture. Our brain cannot tell the difference between stress and danger. Mm. So the stress signal, the brain's trying to help us process what it is misreading as danger. Our stress signal goes to the fight or flight part of the brain, mm. and that's where we're, we're reactive. In that part of the brain, all of our patterns from childhood are hardwired in. Our trauma, our, of where our feelings of abandonment or rejection are not being good enough. And then we react from that part of the brain without any access to our neocortex, right. without any knowing of who we are as adults and who the world is now. So it seems like then we're helpless. If it's hardwired in as a child and like, you know, you're with someone and suddenly they leave and it's like, oh, don't leave me for lunch or something like that. Don't leave me, you know? I mean, because that, then that, you know, that fear of losing this per I mean, it's yeah. how do you change it? Okay, so I, I was just thinking today, um, I'm sorry, I, in, the, in the late 1980s, I wrote a book about this work because nobody was doing it and so, um, and with a sense of synchronicity, somebody sent me an article, I never knew who it was from the Wall Street Journal, that a leading neurobiologist proved this theory, and he said psychotherapy doesn't deal with it. Because if you're dealing with your past, how does that help you right now when you're stressed not to go into the your phantom emotions? That so that feeling of rejection and abandonment is a phantom emotion. But it's also real, because someone's leaving, and it's like... No, 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 well, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Okay. okay? So when I was testing this out, I had a, a client who came in, and she said she and her boyfriend were fighting all week. So I said, what happened? And she said, he's a freelance photographer. They were supposed to go to dinner, and he called her up at the last minute, and he said, um, I have to cancel. I just got an assignment. And she felt abandoned, and, um, and then she got angry at him, mm -hmm. and they fought all week. So I just tried an experiment, uh, um, and I said to her, oh, and after she felt abandoned that she binged, 
And this is a person who owned her own business. She was successful, and she just went into this helpless, abandoned state and ate all night. Like a child. Like a child. So I just tried something out, and I said to her, what do you think it would have been like if you said to Mark, I'm disappointed? Mm. And she said, oh, and that, that feels so much better. And then he would have said something like, me too. And then we would have just rescheduled the date. So why don't people do that? Because the brain is misreading stress for danger and says, oh, you're being left alone. I have that memory of when you were a child and it felt like you were going to die because you were left alone or felt like you were going to die because your mother was depressed and she couldn't hold you and make you feel safe. Right. And nobody told us that the, the brain will hardwire these emotional states in forever because it thinks it's protecting you by, and that's what, when, when we wrote up the description, mm -hmm. we have a syndrome called phant phantom limb. So if a person has a leg amputated, the brain remembers the sensations that that leg had. And so when the br brain starts to feel an itch on that leg or pain in that leg, it feels as if it's real, but the person has a reality check. The reality check is, I don't have a leg. Right. So it can't be my leg that's causing the pain. But we, never, we were never taught that, like this woman Elaine with her boyfriend, that um, our, we can have phantom emotions and that we have to do the reality check and see, are we really abandoned? Are we going to die? Is this a bad person who's trying to hurt me and, by abandoning mm -hmm. me? But if it's so hardwired in the brain, we might rationalize, we might intellectually think that, but the, the uh, a panic comes up in the body. How That's do you right. get to that? Okay, so um, when, when I did this, this session on Keep Using as a Model, I asked Elaine what she felt like when she felt abandoned. She could feel that small, helpless feeling, okay? Then we did a reality check, and, we, and in the book I talk about what, what to do instead. I call it replacement behavior. And what I believe and what neuroscience has now found to be true is that we don't give up an old pattern until we've replaced it. So it, it, it's the same thing. Well, it's just stop binging. You know it's not good for you. But if that's the only way you get comfort and you're going into feeling dangerously abandoned, then you need that comfort. Exactly. So, so I work with people to identify what I call the positive intent. And I know this is going to be a hard concept, so I just want to take a minute with it. Yeah, no, please. I want okay. to learn this stuff, okay. too. I'm Every not... behavior has a positive intent, even though the outcome can be quite hurtful to you or to somebody else. So even if you're binging, the intent is positive. The intent is to comfort yourself. So if I'm working with somebody who's binging, and we actually we did a whole bunch of um, Video. videos, and there's one on overeating. And so when I work with somebody, and I just had a new client come in who can't stop eating bread and butter, that's her comfort food, and we work on creating that state of comfort. So it might be she remembers how she felt when her grandfather took her into the woods and they, mm -hmm. you know, when the sun was shining in her face and she felt this love from him. What we need to be able to do is train our brain and our nervous system to go into the state that we're trying to achieve, that we have a positive intent about when, we're, when she's eating the bread and butter, but the bread and butter has a boomerang. She's, she feels out of control, she's diabetic, she feels like she's hurting her health. So there's nothing wrong with eating bread and butter, but if it, if it boomerangs on you, um, then it's not successful in terms of fulfilling the positive. So when she has an impulse to eat the bread and butter, what would the replacement behavior be? Okay, now that's the trick. Okay. You don't wait till you have the impulse to eat bread and butter. Oh. Because once you're triggered, boom, the brain is saying, you have to, you have to, you have to. I mean, how many times have we reacted and we said, how could I have done that? You know, because the, when we're in the fear part of the brain, we are reacting. Just, it's a reflex. So if the doctor hits you under your knee with a rubber hammer, your leg goes up. That's a reflex. Nobody taught us that the brain has no wisdom. The brain is a reflexive organ just for fight, flight, or freeze. It's just to protect us. So one of the things that we start doing is 
we thank our brain for trying to protect us. You don't fight those re right. reactive reflexes. Okay, okay, brain, you're trying to soothe me. You're giving me the image of uh, telling me to go eat bread and butter. But what you've done before you had that impulse is you practiced being that soothed, comforted child with your grandfather. So your brain and your body have learned that feeling. Oh, so you have another way of dealing when the stress comes up. Exactly, because you can't wait. It, it, once you trigger it, it's really hard to pull back. So, what, see, when I first started doing this work, neuroscience said that the brain can't change past age seven. I said, uh-uh, can't be. So I practiced on myself, and then I started working with my clients. Now, because we got live imaging of the brain, we didn't have the technology <laughs> to really understand. Live imaging of the brain has informed us of the fact that the brain is plastic. There's a term, neuroplasticity, neuromodularity. The brain can change in form and function for the rest of our lives. There is no pattern that can't be changed. Mm -hmm. But you do say that once the emotion at five years old, or once our emotional body learns something, it's, it's stuck. There's no progression. Uh, in the ch in the childish way of dealing with your well, emotions. See, okay. Can you again, explain that yeah, a little better? Yeah, because there are a number of things, again, in making this quest for what gets in our way. So if, when we know what's in our way, then we can remove it. If we don't know what's in our way, we can't, we can't change it. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of somebody named Piaget, but he studied cognitive development in children. So. If, um, if you're playing ball, this is the ball, with a very young child, and you put the ball behind your back, the child thinks it disappeared because the cognitive uh, function of object constancy has not evolved yet. When the child gets a little older, you put the ball behind your back, they go behind your back and they look for it. Well, in order to survive, we needed to know that objects are constant. When you're storing food, we have to remember that we have food. Um, unfortunately, Emotions do not evolve. That's what I mean. Chronologically. Because um, having mature, effective emotions is a quality of life issue. And we're still stuck in the survival mode. So, what I call mo my work instead of psychotherapy is emotional education. And it has two major components one is finding your positive intent and working with each person creatively to find a replacement behavior that they can then hardwire in. What we know from neuroscience mm -hmm. is, there's a great book called The Brain That Changes Itself and it has a beautiful research. What, what the slogan in contemporary neuroscience is, neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that don't fire together, unwire. So if I'm practicing being peaceful, I am building in and hardwiring in that, that feeling of peace, which then becomes my identity. I'm, I'm a peaceful person. Mm. I'm not this reactive, overeating person. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that, the neural pathways and all the neurotransmitters that created the pattern of, of binge eating unwire. They dissolve. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so we can build in any pattern, but it, it requires some, some practice. For me, practicing is like, ah, oh, it's a gift. Oh, I'm practicing feeling good. Right. Um, so, um, okay, if someone has a tendency to binge or do some other self-sabotaging. No, 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 not self-sabotaging. A, a positive intent that they haven't learned how to fulfill. There's no self-sabotage. There's no self thing as self-sabotage, yeah. even if like you... No, you know, no. That's all for a way of comforting. It may look weird, but it's a good... Oh, can I just give you an please. example? So when I first started working, I was in a clinic, and one of the first clients I had was a man who put cigarette butts out oh. on his arm. So that, he said, well, that, what that the hell? How can little... there be a positive intent in that? He was an absolute genius. He got a perfect score on every mm -hmm. standardized test, but his family was cold, and he just felt like a computer. No body, no feelings. Uh. So he felt alive when he put the cigarette out. So of course we worked with other ways of feeling alive, right. but he wasn't trying to hurt himself. N not, not he, yeah, so no one self sabotage It's a way they seek comfort, or the best way they know how? Yeah, the, the person that I call my philosophical father 
was named Kurt Goldstein, mm -hmm. and he developed the only organism theory he, um, that I have just seen in the West. And he believed, he, he came from the time of Freud, he mm -hmm. believed all of that death instinct, id fighting ego, didn't accurately describe human beings or any, any living organism. He said all living organisms have one drive, and that's for mastery, to be the best that they can be. And I used to have a plant in my office, and there was no light. And then there was a window over here, and the plant would grow crooked. So I'd be talking to people like when we were talking here, and I'd say, now would you call that a bad plant because it's crooked? But we call people bad. But what if you, uh, someone has suicidal thoughts, they're chronically depressed, they're just like, you know... Uh, been uh, there, yeah. You've been there? No, I've been there with people. Oh, you've been there with people. I, I, so what do you do for that? I mean, that, that, what's the, there's no positive intent to suicide. Oh, yes, there is. What, what would that be? Ending the pain. Okay, I guess. When people are in extreme pain and they've tried so many things and they, and they have conditioned hopelessness, remember, just imagine if you've ever seen a newborn infant. They're pure. They're joy, they're love, they're open, they're receptive. And then we get conditioning. So if that, there was a horrible experiment many years ago when people were not so sophisticated, where they went down to these nurseries in South America to see, this is small response in babies conditioned or innate. And so they took these babies who had nobody taking care of them, one nun to 30 babies, mm -hmm. And an experimenter came in and smiled and coochie coo the first time the little baby had um, contact. And then they said, well, let's see if we can decondition it. So, the, Wait, so did the baby respond with the, a smile? The, the, yeah, the baby was delighted to have that, that interaction. Uh -huh. Then they wanted to see if they could extinguish the smile response or if it would stay. Uh -huh. so, the, so if I'm the experimenter, you're the baby, I go there and I'm impassive. And the baby's looking for a reaction. And it doesn't get it. Mm. You know what happened? No. A lot of the babies died. They picked up mm. infections. Mm. I because mean, they didn't have any connection. Because, right? yeah, they got depressed. And wow. their immune systems got depressed. So we're all that baby, depending on how, how we're interacted with. So, but if someone's in so much pain from whatever emotional um, situation they had as a child, th that's hard. Why? How do you free them from whatever I, that pain is? Because with, I've never met a person, uh -huh. and maybe of course it's selective because people who come to me have some hope. Even if they're coming and talking about their hopelessness, they wouldn't be there if they didn't have some hope. So. I feel like it's, it's my, um, my pleasure to find where they have some feeling, some feeling that something can be good. And it could be, it could be, could be feeling when they go under the shower and, and the warm water is pulsating on their body. Whatever that is, we just build on it. Whatever that little piece of their aliveness is. We just build on it. And there, there's something else. Um, because we did one of the videos that I felt was very important to do was a video on unconditional love. Right. And um, it's, to me, it's an important part of this whole process of, of, of changing and growing. Because every, again, going back to that little baby that you're looking at, that baby deserves unconditional love. But if a parent doesn't know how to give it because they didn't get it and they don't, they don't know where to draw it from, that child will lose the, the experience, all the good things that you get when you're unconditionally loved. Mm -hmm. So I know for myself, I did a lot of work for myself, and then I had the good fortune of meeting and training with an energy healer who is the most loving person I ever met. And that, that receiving of love, where you can say, you can say, and you're telling your secret, and you think she's going to go, ah. Um, and it's like, oh, well, is that, is that helping you? Is that empowering you or not empowering you? So that, how does it work for you, that behavior? Not you're being a bad person. Hmm. And so when I work with people, I work to be um, the replacement for the criticism they got, the, any kind of um, judgment or abuse hmm. that they got, or just when a, when a child is neglected, they feel that they're being told they're not good enough because they're not worthy of attention. So to me, the, the work that I do with the people is a very intimate process because, um, and I often do it by reporting something on their phone, because most people don't even know how to receive love when they get it. So um, 
the mo one of the most common... Uh, Wait, most people don't know how to receive love when they get it. Yeah, okay, I guess that just... I, I have to process that. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. okay. So, it's very common for me to have a single woman come in um, and she said, she'll say, I have great relationships with my friends, but all my relationships with men are disasters. So I always want to build on what's positive. So I'll say, can you resurrect a memory of a good experience you had with a friend? And she'll tell me this beautiful story about what her friend did for her birthday, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'll say, okay, what do you feel? Nothing. I know it happened, but there's nothing in the body. Because what happens is when we're children, if we're looking like those babies looking for the experiment to smile and put you cool, and they don't get it, they shut down. Mm -hmm. So our receptors, I have a term that I call the, the receptive response. Our receptors shut down, and we become vigilant for who's going to hurt us. Oh. OK? And that's part of the phantom em emotion. Right. Um, because I, I remember there was a time when, when I had allergies and I'd take an antihistamine at night and in the morning I could feel like I wasn't fully alert. I know that there were some of my clients who wouldn't see the same sparkle in my eye and they would feel rejected. So I learned when I met them at the <laughs> elevator to have to say, I'm not quite as alert because otherwise they would feel shamed by not, my, oh. not being interested. So the receptive response, and that's why I feel like my work is very intimate because I, I want, in a safe environment, I want to help people to be receptive. Uh, of course, it helps our work together, but I want to teach them how not to be vigilant for rejection. Well, well how do you teach that? Because everyone, I, oh, oh, you're not there yet. Oh, okay, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's okay, I know, you're, I no, know no, what I like no, here. No, no, no. I'm but, um, so when I'm working with somebody and I'm saying something warm to them and I can see I can see fear in their eyes and then we work on what what the fear is and then coming back and we keep working until and it may may be more than one session and as I said I'll record it on their phone so they can listen to it and I'll say tell me what gets in the way of you receiving mm -hmm. a lot of what gets in the way is um, it makes me feel vulnerable and I think how can I trust you and what if you take it away so we work on that mm. I, have I done anything to show you that I'm going to switch gears have I shown you that in any way that I'm judgmental or critical and they'll say no but they never perceived it that way because they were shut down mm. well you did it uh, you were working with me and tell uh, you used to t t you used to say t tell them what you used to say to me I would say uh, that I loved you unconditionally and my response is what does this woman want from me <laughs> why are you saying that who you don't know who I am <laughs> really I said that why would what yeah, but why would you love me? I mean, what did I do for you? I mean, all those responses, but now, now say it now. I love you unconditionally. Wow, thank you very much. I, I, I mean, that's because I've worked with her, and it's like, that's so, it's okay to feel, I mean, I feel now it's okay for Helen to love me. I mean, I'm not taking it in because, thank you, uh, because it actually, it's okay for you, to love me. but it's, you know, I processed it and there was nothing threatening. There's no ulterior motive. There was. But, but you were having a phantom emotion. Yeah. You, were fe you were projecting. See, in our phantom emotions, <coughs> we project onto other people and we never see them. So you were projecting onto me that I was going to want something. Right. I was getting what, anything that I needed because it was a pleasure to love you. That's really nice. It's a pleasure to be loved. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, when I hear your voice and I feel your energy, it fills me with a loving feeling. Wow. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting close. I'm getting <laughs> we can do no, some more work. No, but it does feel good to be loved and to let it in. It's like, wow, that actually feels good when I let it in just to be loved for no reason at all for just being for just being yeah yeah. And, and, yeah and yeah and so it's you know and i'll say to people of course i want our relationship to be as comfortable as possible and even more than that i want to remove the phantom emotions so that you can get out into the world and receive the love that's already there for you 
So in the past, maybe someone would say that to me, and then they would want something, or I would have to be a certain way, and that was like... Well, you, you probably felt that early on in your childhood. I, I, I probably have, yes. And why would I feel that early on? Well, a lot, you know, you may have what I call sensitive male syndrome. <laughs> okay. Well, what, what I, what I guess I that's better found, than other things. What do you can tell me? I don't know. I don't no, no. Know. I, I, but, but what I found was a lot of sensitive men who were sensitive boys, uh -huh. they had mothers who had problems. Sometimes they had insensitive husbands, and they looked to the sensitive son for right. that male sensitivity. And what, what then happens is, it's also what I call learned failure and makes having relationships with women very difficult. Really? Yeah, I'll tell you <laughs> Maybe we should just do a private session here. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, Alan. No, go uh, ahead. But go ahead. But what happens is you can't, you can't as this little boy, no matter how much you want to help your mother, let's say, let's say a sensitive boy has a, a father who's insensitive and the mm -hmm. mother's feeling lonely or emotionally abused, he can't compensate for that. So that's why I call it learned failure. You're giving all the love that you have mm -hmm. and it's not making a difference. So how do I get over that? <laughs> what do I need to do? Who do I need to love? <laughs> you need to let me love you more. <laughs> sure. But if I want to feel love, I mean, if I want to get over, let's say that is possible, how would I well, then? Well, what happens is what, what I learned, um, I used to say that everybody has an idiosyncratic definition of love and connection. So if, if, you, if you had to be a caretaker in order to get love, it's almost like caretaking and love get fused. Right. You either pick people that need caretaking, which means you're not getting anything back, or you imagine they need caretaking and don't ask for anything and just try to get the connection by caretaking. Either way, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But what I found um, through neuroscience is that we actually have in our brain something called attractor neurons. And whatever pattern we had of love early in life, our brain learned that pattern and we developed neurons that actually we can read each other's brains all the time in a millisecond, mm -hmm. but we, it's below our radar, we don't know what's happening. So if you had um, a mother that you couldn't satisfy, your brain is saying to you, okay, you need that pattern or else you're going to be alone forever. I need what pattern? The pattern of loving somebody who can't be satisfied. I need that because that's, that's what I'm used to. That's the attractive norm says that's what a relationship is. Oh, so that it's explains. nothing or that. That's not masochism. Either nothing or that. Yeah, because those are the types of people that were programmed into my, the one, yeah. So yes, how do I. That's not your psyche. And this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is your physiology. Again, the, the fight, flight, or freeze rate. So how do we get over that one? Wow. Um, I have more problems than I thought. No, it's okay. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's a matter of being aware. Um, and like I said, and that's why I made, I made the, um, the video on unconditional love. It's just receiving it so that it starts to feel, when you receive love, you change the attractive neurons. Mm. So that when I'm working with people, and I, I had a, a wonderful experience with a man many years ago who, uh, I won't go into the details of the abusive relationship he was in, and, and he kept finding people that were just not able to connect. And then, and then one day he came in and he said, uh, he said I'm in a good relationship, and I'm, uh, when I'm talking to her, he feels just as comfortable as when I'm talking to you. Mm. Because his attractive neurons change. Right. So if I can receive love, then I won't have to um, go out and find someone who's always need, n needing love. So the more I'm able to receive love, the less of those phantom emotions run me. And, the, and your attractive neurons change, so you can actually look. You, you know, we think we're only attracted to people by physical attraction, but we don't know that the brain is determining so much of what attracts us. And even, you know, I, I used to say um, words that were music to my ears when somebody would come in after working for a while and they'd say, well, I'm, I, I met this man or this woman. I really like them, but they're not my type. i say, hallelujah. <laughs> right. So those, those were the people they, ha they had long-term relationships with. But if it's not their type, mm -hmm. Then, because their type was based on old patterns. Right, but how do they get to be like sort of a try? I mean, do they force themselves to be no, a No, 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 no. But that's the work we do. That's the right. work we do in 
creating feelings of peace, creating intimacy. I used to um, I used to do groups four nights a week, but that was before we became a 24/7 culture. So nobody nobody has a regular normal time that they could come to a group. But that was very good because people mm -hmm. could receive from other people other than me. But mm -hmm. I always invite people. People will tell me they have a sister, a brother, a lover, a husband, whatever, and they'll tell me all these awful things about the person, their pain and whatever, and I'll say, okay, I know this person could pass a lie detector test believing what they're saying, but I don't know if it's a phantom emotion and a projection mm. until I meet that person. Right. So I've seen people um, who have all kinds of dis distortions about people and didn't even realize that they were setting things. I had a woman who came in and said, my family doesn't want any part of me. They make plans to go out for dinner. They don't include me. So I said, okay, would one of your brothers come in? And she said, yes. And he came in and, and he said to her, we invited you all the time. You always said, I'm seeing a friend. I'm going on a ski trip or whatever. She had conditioned them not to invite her and then was feeling victimized and, and rejected. So that Thanksgiving, a couple of months later, I had a phone machine, it was before cell phones, and she left me a voicemail and she said, thank you for giving me my family back. Mm. She didn't know that she was doing it. And we don't know what we're doing. We yeah. don't know that when we project something, like somebody's tired and we project they're rejecting us, and then we get angry and we withdraw, we don't know that we're pushing them away. Right. Because we've had a phantom emotion, and, and it's very hard, because when you have the phantom emotion, it's in your body. And your brain is telling you, well, my brain is smart, so my brain says I'm rege being rejected, and my body feels collapsed and in pain. Mm. It must be real. But, you know, it's it could, because we don't have the reality check that mm. we have when we have a phantom limb syndrome. So I have one more question, then we'll take questions for Helen from the audience. But you talk about emotional dyslexia. That's a term you use a lot. Can you explain that? Yeah, it, emotional dyslexia was a term I used when I was writing my book, because what I realized is that if, um, if, if you're feeling stressed and, um, and your brain is misreading it as danger, and then you're going to what I, in the book I call the child brain, so you have the brain power of a three-year-old, and then you react with that brain power, you're gonna create an effect that's the opposite of what you want. So when I was talking about Elaine and Mark, when she was angry at him because he got a, jo a you know a last minute job, she was pushing him away when she wanted him cl closer. And he's thinking, "What is going on here? This is right. my this is my work." Right, right, right. So, uh, so, so she how did she overcome that? By practicing staying staying as the adult and uh -huh. feeling the connection to him. I mean, what's your history with him? He's you know, because she talked about him a lot. He's a sensitive, caring person. She just got, she got triggered. And we all need to know what are our characteristic ways of responding. You know, I'm going to change that word. It's reacting, because we're not responding. What are our characteristic ways of reacting when we're in fear? And then also to know the people around us. What are their characteristic ways of responding when they're in fear? Because we don't know uh. how other people get when they're in fear. Like if you if you have somebody, or maybe somebody you work with, who always gets judgmental or critical, and you give them the power to hurt you, they're coming from fear and weakness, and then you're letting them disempower you. Mm -hmm. So I always say in my office, I have a mirror behind me, and I always say, if somebody is saying anything diminishing or demeaning to you, imagining they're talking to themselves in the mirror. This is what they learned, and this is what our, where our culture has come. We just have to watch the news. That power means I'm better than you, and I can humiliate you, and I can shame you. And we have a president who lives with such an enormous, painful shame that the only way you can try to escape it is by shaming somebody else. Right. So um, I just wanted to say so that that uh, Trump has so much shame in him that he has buried his conscious mind underneath that and well it's also what we know again the, when you study the live imaging of brain we know that the brains of psychopaths sociopaths and narcissists 
are missing gray matter in the area of the brain that allows us to feel compassion and empathy. So it's not like they're, you know, I've heard pundits say, how could he not have compassion for the, uh, for, for the, the environment, the, the, the gold, this gold star family, right. this or that? It's, it's, a, it's a brain defect. So yeah. when I'm working with somebody who is somebody like that in their life, they keep giving, my mother's rejecting me. No, she doesn't know how to feel compassion. So, I, like I said to one man whose father wouldn't come to see his new baby, and I said, and he was so hurt, and I said, do you know the, the love you feel for your wife and the love that you feel for your new child? Your father will live and die and never know that feeling. Right. So he does, he's not hurting you, he just doesn't have it. And we keep thinking that people, when we're little children, and you, you can imagine, we're so small, our parents are so big, it feels like he, they could do anything if they really wanted. So if they're not loving me, it must be because I feel, they feel that I'm, I'm not worthy of being loved. And then we spend our whole lives and our whole culture, oh, okay, well, what's making me unworthy? Am I not good looking enough? Do I not have enough money? Am I not smart enough? Mm -hmm. and, and we were never not enough. We just didn't get enough. There's a big difference. So we have to give that to us. That's the hard part, giving no, it to ourselves. Yeah, well, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe you can give yourself, well, maybe you can. Right. My experience is find somebody to help you to help stimulate that, whether it's a guru, a teacher, whatever. Mm. Somebody that you can trust, that you can take it in. Start, start you can start in nature. You know, uh, there's a, a spiritual um, teacher who said, um, I'm talking about unconditional love. He said, the sun shines on everything. It doesn't judge who gets the shine. Mm. And so you want to be with somebody who shines love on everything, with no judgment, no conditions. But I want to say one more thing yeah, about please. love. Yeah, please. Okay, so when I, when I was um, first developing this work and I had a lot of health problems, I decided that I was going to do love meditations. And what I didn't realize um, at the time, but now neuroscience has taught us, spiritual practices knew this for eons, is that when we are in, a, in our heart-centered states of being, which are not emotions, like the sun shines on everything, when we are in love, when we are in compassion, mm -hmm. we turn off the fear centers of our brain. Oh. Pretty powerful stuff, because then we can access our neocortex in service of love, and compassion. So as one of my favorite people on the planet, Ramdas, says, the mind makes a horrible master but a wonderful servant. If, it, if, the, if the mind is serving fear... They'll do it really well. Right? Yeah, and I would say the, the difference between a zebra and a man, okay? A predator comes into a herd of zebras. The zebras fight flight, they run. Okay, now you follow one zebra, and it's on uh, a, a quiet plane. What animals do, because they produce all these toxic chemicals mm. that we do. In from fire, fear, from yeah, fear. from flight to flight. The animals just shake. They shake it out of their system, and you know what? It's all gone. Mm -hmm. It's over. They're grazing, they're peaceful, there's no what ifs and whatever. A man's on a plane, and there's a lot of turbulence, and, and he thinks he's going to die, and he comes off and he says, oh my God, I have three children. I don't have enough money put away. What if I get killed? Blah, 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 blah. And then everything after that is informed by that fear state because the mind got stuck in that fear state. So how do they shake it out? Well, we have to come back to reality, okay? You didn't die, <laughs> you know, and, right. and, just, and go back, constantly going back to peace. We have so many opportunities in our, in our lives. A lot of people do um, an exercise where in the morning and the evening, they'll write down what they appreciate in their life and what they're grateful for, because that takes us into that love state. Um, so it could be, I'm, I'm grateful that the heat is working in my apartment. It's not like I'm grateful that I won the lottery. It's just really feeling, I mm. have, I have. I'm not, as children, we stay in that state of deprivation and lack, and then we keep projecting it. Mm. And then I we keep it. thinking we need more than we need. 
So your practice or your experience is to find that love, some, and, uh, help yourself receive that love, practice in those places where you're not reacting, and um, be present in the moment to well, face you, reality. When, you, when you're not reacting, then you're present. Right. But most of our emotions and most of our thoughts have to do with the past. Mm. And so, I, I, years ago, I wrote an article and I said, you know, for me, I've heard a lot of stories about abuse to mm. people had as children. That's not the painful part to me. I mean, it's sad, mm. but the painful part is they keep projecting it out into the world now, even though it's not there. And so they live in that place forever. Mm. So I, used, I, I said, it's like being born in the desert and then you're living in a rainforest, but you don't know how to open up your mouth and catch the water. Right, so you, you, you do what? So you help people to, to be present. Uh -huh. Well, the other great thing you said, and then we'll take some questions, is that when there's a huge reaction, when there's a lot of, um, about a little thing. Melodrama. What, when there's melodrama, like, I don't know what it would be. Uh, I, I know what it is. Oh, it's, it's, give an example. Th things go in cycles. So the word I hear the most, epidemic of, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm uh -huh. overwhelmed. Well, can you imagine just sending that, that signal? Can you imagine walking up to somebody and saying, you're overwhelmed, you're, uh, how would they feel? <laughs> but we do that to ourselves all the time. <laughs> so I say, oh, you mean there's a tsunami coming? <laughs> um, we may have, we, so I do replacement behavior, Repl okay? Yes. So you have a lot of work on your plate. Now what choices do you want to make about what you do? Now some of those choices might be I'm, I'm going to choose to cancel some social plans because I'm choosing to finish the work that I have because I want to meet a deadline mm -hmm. or whatever. That's a choice. Mm -hmm. Then you're not a victim, okay? So you feel the positive intent mm -hmm. is what it's going to feel like if you get this project done. You can be compassionate to yourself that you're, um, that you're missing a social engagement. And I have an aphorism, which is, if you can master the art of disappointment, you've got the world by the balls. So we, if you can say, I'm disappointed that I can't go out, but I'm not a victim, and mm -hmm. I'm not deprived, and I'm not overwhelmed. It's two very different states of being. Right. And that's also similar to your example, if there's an overreaction like that woman who was disappointed because her boyfriend. Uh, I, I, it's generally not what's happening now, it, like I think it you've said it, and, from, yeah, an, and that's what I tried from a childhood I, experience. When I was teaching this work and writing, this is a very pragmatic self-help book, it was about what are the words that you're going to use? What's the difference? Like children, children have no sense of time. The moment is forever. I can't stand this. And that's the child of the, the little toddler that cries because their parents are going out and they have no sense of time. Their parents go out and then they come back. We get triggered into that. So when you say, I can't stand this another minute, you're, go you're going into a, a deprived childhood mm -hmm. state with yeah. no resources. That's right. Anytime you have an overreaction, look to see if that's like, an old childhood and when experience. You, and when you're with somebody else, a, a, a communication tool, uh -huh. when you're with somebody else who's melodramatic and, and um, the, the end of the world and nothing works or whatever, don't reason with them. What do you mean? Okay. They're in the fear part of the brain. They can't access their neural cortex. Oh. So imagine there were a three-year-old child that's really scared. Um, you can't argue with a three-year-old child. So you create empathy, and you can say, you know, uh, I, see, I see that you're having a hard time. I'm here. Is there anything I can do to help you? Mm -hmm. if you could, for some people, if you can make the empathic or compassionate connection, it may take them out of that feeling of helplessness and aloneness, and it may actually invite them to go into their adult brain. But as I always say, you can extend the invitation, but you can't make another person accept it. Mm. So you can try doing, you know, I have a lot of tools for communication. There's nothing that's foolproof, because if somebody is really triggered into all the phantom emotions, right. they may not be able to come out. Right. But they're not trying to hurt you, and they're not trying to be resistant. They and, just can't come and out. And they're not trying to hurt themselves. They're just trying to they're, be, they're, they're just they, being the child that they've never. Their brain is saying this is life and death. Uh -huh. Okay, that's right. all, all of your responses is the brain is saying, this is survival. Mm. 
And when we become present, we realize it's we grow up from the child to the adult in when two get, seconds. And when we get the mm -hmm. help. Right. So I, can I make one invitation? Sure, please. As long as I have some nice people here. They, I think they're nice. Yeah. I know. I, let me see. I can feel. I might so, be reacting. So <laughs> I, I have oh, 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 I so I have an open invitation. But there's one thing I would love support within my life, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is, I would love to have access, more access to parents and teachers, because we, can, I've worked with children. Children get it right away. They move right out of it because they have the, the drive for mastery. So if we can get children early enough, it doesn't mm. matter even what's going on in their, in their families. They can have these tools and they can grow up their emotions. So I, years ago, would offer free workshops for teachers. I was doing a project with somebody who had some funding, but I said, if you don't give the teachers a stipend, they work so hard that they're grading papers, they're preparing lessons, that even if you offer it to them for free, they need to be excused from some of their duties to be able to do this. But if anybody has access, I, when I work with parents, I feel like I'm working for them and their children at the same time. Mm. So that's, that's uh, an unfinished um, need of mine. It mm. would be a pleasure to do. Okay. What's the best format for you for that? Speaking I, this I can pass um, this iPad around and oh, people can... That's a good idea. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sign in. So we I, have. I'm, I'm open to any. I'm open to. But any yeah. venue that that would reach people. Because uh, when I work with parents, they want to be. They want to do better for their kids. They just don't have the tools. Yeah, you're helping two people at that point. Yeah. I mean, but is and any future generations, right? And everybody that that child. And everyone counts. on the planet. But yeah. does anyone have a question particularly? Because I mean, I have more. But if we, yeah, yeah, you. Have, right. uh, you become aware of all of this. Uh, Nate, if you if you if you contact me, um, there's another technology that I use. It's called Morphic Awakening, and it's a healing technology. And I combine. It's magical. There's, I've never come across anything healing that for mind, body, and spirit. I combine the two together. But we did. We can do that another time. But if anybody's interested, just. Um, email me at Helen and HelenKramer.com and I'll send you a blog and some videos um, on it's called Morphic Awakening but when I combine the Morphic Awakening with the work that I already do and the, the, the synergy between the two is magnificent. Okay, another question. And, uh, oh. If you can describe this a little bit for people that don't know what that is. Uh, well it's, it's a therapy, it's a whole other thing than what she's talking about so just I mean, it's like more of an it's energetic. A way, it's a way of, of tapping into the healing energy in the universe, and you can heal relationships, financial problems, and when I first started doing it, it I healed all my health problems. I never had a healthy day in my life, and um, I didn't know what spiritual awakening was, and it just kept happening and happening and happening. And as I said, the fact that I had done the work that I was just talking about now, I think opened me up to being receptive. So when I do the two together with people, it's, it's quite well, transformative. We could come back here and do an uh, evening of Morphic Awakening. Yeah, yeah. Okay, question. Hi, so nice to meet you. Thanks for sharing. We do similar work. It's really validating to hear your languaging because sometimes I think I'm making this stuff up. Um, I work with millennial uh, entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. They say I adult them. <laughs> and I want to ask you specifically about, you brought up narcissism. I had five sets of co-founders last year and I broke them all up. They wait too long to get assistance. And in my opinion, four out of five of them had a empath narcissistic relationship where the narcissist was feeding off the empath, and right. the empath feeds off the narcissist too. And then what I would see is that, regardless of their gender or sexual orientation, one was masculine and one was feminine. And so when they connect, it's very powerful, but as soon as there's any disconnect over ego, lack of money, <coughs> they um, bring up, they actually, project 
the opposite sex parent onto one another? Well, one of the things that I've noticed um, in with my friends, family, and clients, um, and it may be another way of describing some of what you see, what I find is that the narcissist was shamed and experienced a lot of shame growing up. When they see a, a very good, caring person, it's subconsciously, it's not conscious at all, it's like, oh, if I had only had this kind of love when I was young, I, I wouldn't feel shame. So they connect to this person, and we know, I mean, most people aren't trying to say, shouldn't say we know, um, when we fall in love, in order to get us to procreate, we produce dopamine and oxytocin and endorphins, which are there for us to procreate, then they, then they wane. And what happens with the narcissist is they do feel reborn. They do feel like, ah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, the uh, frog that was ki kissed by the princess and now I'm a prince. When, when those chemicals wane, for most people there's a period of disappointment or feeling rejected. Because you used to make me feel so good and now you don't. Now you want to go to sleep instead of having sex with me or whatever. But for the narcissist, there can also be a phenomenal amount of anger. And all the anger that they felt to the, towards the parent, we shame them. Mm. And they can be vindictive and vicious. Yeah. And trying to get divorced from one of these people can cost a fortune and take, and take forever. <laughs> but their positive intent was to become the prince. And that we and we're all hypnotized, like all of the do-over. We're all hypnotized into thinking we and by our culture. If we didn't get what we needed as children, um, we can get it. We have the do-over when somebody falls in love with us, and that's the kiss of death for all relationships. I always say, uh, the, you, oh, oh, so someone falls in love with us, and then we think, oh, here's a chance to get what my mother or father never gave me. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not necessarily thinking it consciously, but all the love songs, everything is about, and all, you know, and all they, You're saying they can't give it to us what my no. they can't? No. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> get over, get over that minute. Real, who's going to give me what I never got? And you take it in. Take it in what? Well, what we were talking about before, take, if you feel lovable, yeah. and you feel the sun is shining on you, Yes then you just invite you, oh. you invite somebody into your life who shares that feeling with you they don't create it you know my my uh, way of describing it is you need to be the cake and the relationship is the icing mm. if you don't feel like the cake th then then the icing is just going to drip off <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I, I, but i understand i understand you know i always say to people when they come i wish i could go like this and all those patterns would be gone. I'm sorry that it takes work. If I find a way to do it like this, believe me, you'll be hearing me talk all over the place. But that, but that is why people go into relationship for the most part to get what their parents never gave them. To be redeemed. To be to yeah, get out of to their be loved. To yeah. be out of their suffering. And so that's not the right reason to go into relationship. I'm just trying to get it. Yeah. Well, that you know, but it's it's the same thing as. When I said when you're a young child and you think your parents are so big and powerful and you think they can give you everything, but they don't have it to give. They're in, stuck in their own suffering. So it, you, you find another adult and they have their pain and their projections and their phantom emotions. What a perfect match. <laughs> it doesn't work. Because then you bring the resentment against each other and it's just... And yeah, when I, when, I, when, I started, when I started working with Surya, it was a short time after my husband had died, and that was a hard time in my life. Fortunately, I had 26 years of lots of love back and forth. Um, and I used to say something like, I, you know, I just saw a friend and felt like we didn't really connect. You know, I came home and I felt lonely or something. And she taught me, she said, you know, when I see people, I don't go to connect, I, I want to laugh. <laughs> I mean. We don't look at relationships as opportunities for fun. We look to get our, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to be a little sarcastic. No, go we look, we look to get our needs met. Right. But adults, adults aren't mm -hmm. children who have needs. They're not? No. What are adults? Adults are people, if you're helped to be an adult, you feel 
good in your own skin. You have good c ways of, like, you master the art of disappointment. You have the world by the balls. And then, you, and then I mean, I, you know, what I used to say, you, you know. fulfill your own needs. What? You can fulfill your own needs. You know, what, they, yeah, they're you not, they're, what happens <laughs> is they're not there anymore. Right. They're not there. I don't walk around with needs. You don't? You know, like you don't know. You have a need to be loved, right? No. No. Okay. No. I. I mean. I. I mean. I'm. I've worked hard. Right. And, and I'm not. I'm not trying. Um, I'm not trying to be glib in any way. But um, if and, and and I'm not saying that um, that I. If somebody hurts me, if somebody does something and it feels like, and I feel hurt and say, thank you. Because I had a trigger I didn't know. I went into a phantom emotion. Well, that's a very mature approach. Well, you know, I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as liberating. Well, because that, I, but if someone else gets a trigger, you say, that son of a bitch, you know? It's like, um, it will, so. Or, you, you know, I didn't deserve it, and, yeah. you know, and I never get what I need, and exactly. nobody ever appreciates me. And that's all the, that's all the phantom stuff, and it, it hurts us so much. Mm. It's painful. So, yeah, I've had experiences where it, where I felt, you know, hurt by somebody or disappointed that I wasn't getting the kind of attention that they'd given me in the past or whatever. And and I feel take that as an opportunity. Oh, I have more to clear. Right. And I let myself feel the hurt. And I now there's a difference. And I, this is going to be a little bit difficult. There's a difference between feeling the sensations of hurt and going into a story. Right. And this is what, why I don't call myself a psychotherapist, because so much psychotherapy is about telling you a story. And every time you tell your story, you're Oh, that person did this to me. And, and, then. and you're hardwiring in the old identity. And what, what I've seen studies where they say talk therapy doesn't change the brain. And that's why I left the whole therapeutic community that I was a part of, because I felt well-meaning people were hurting people. I had, I was, I was supervising somebody doing group therapy at one point. There was one woman who came in, and she told her story, and she cried, and she got all this comfort. Well, every week she came in and told another story and cried <laughs> because that became her way of getting comfort. So she get, so she was stuck that right. that 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 became a way of getting feeling good. Now I believe when people come in, and they have. Pain, a painful story. Well, I want to know what the story is because I want to know how they got the pattern. And I also want to give them the experience of receiving compassion. Okay, but, but again, that's over. That's not now. Okay, so we know it's going to be re-triggered. It's like that reflex in, under your knee. We know it's going to be re-triggered. But do you want to keep going there? Wasn't it hard enough to live it once? Do we want to... So, so it, like if someone says something that's not nice, oh, I might feel a little pain because, but then, like, let it, okay, I felt that, but you don't have to dramatize it, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's also about looking at the other person. Right. Like I was saying, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt had a quote, nobody can humiliate you without your cooperation. Right. So if I, if somebody, if somebody's saying something that happened to me where somebody was saying something very humiliating, I mean, just vicious, and I was thinking, oh, there's suffering, right? And they were upset that they didn't hurt me. Mm. And I, all I could feel was sad and compassion. Like that's where you have to go when you're not feeling good. Mm. That's so. That's what you do to yourself. I'll give you another tool. Every time you judge somebody else, you're strengthening what I call the judgmental muscle, and you're going to judge yourself. So I trained myself. Years ago, riding on the subway, there's somebody sitting across from me with garish makeup and garish clothes, mm -hmm. and you feel, uh huh? And I said, oh, so she got up in the morning like I do, and she wanted to look her best. That's what I do. That's what looked good to her. So it's like peeling the onion. That was her positive intent. And all of a sudden, she's a dignified human being, I'm a dignified human being. And if somebody can't treat me like a dignified human being, I know that they're suffering. Right. So why would I, why would I why would I be angry at somebody who's suffering? Right. No, I think it's good. Do you have anything to say, Edmonds? <laughs> he's he's a good. Thing. He has a lot of things to say. Here, just pass that mic over there. He has a thing to say. No, I'm just curious. Oh, did you want to say something? Well, I mean, 
Oh, did you want to say something? Because I'm just curious what you're sure, thinking I'm about. Sure. Uh, if I'm asked, I will always I go, offer something. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, you can, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, some people back there might ask you. Oh, okay. Um, That's better. Yeah. Do you have a question? No, I was saying because she seemed to be acknowledging a lot of what she's saying. So what's been your experience of, you know, working with yourself and overcoming certain patterns that you're hearing? Well, I go from the, the science that says that the developmental stages of the first three chakras mm -hmm. that occur mm -hmm. between... Uh, the third trimester of of gestation all the way till about two years old, two to three years old, is it's an energetic, emotional learning patterns. It's not mental learning patterns. They're not children are not linear in that in those stages. They have very basic needs, and it's been interesting actually for me to dive into my own phantom emotions. And I would even say those are the ones that I even that, that, that actually exist in a state of deep denial. And... What would they be? Well, like, I've actually, like, recently I've had some experiences going, like, like going into the womb and feeling, and, and feeling what my first feelings were. Yeah, 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 I've done a lot of that, too, yeah. Yeah. That's where I want, because I was born with all these illnesses, so I, I knew everything started in the womb. But yeah. what would your feeling be in the womb? No one's, no one's insulted you yet, or... Uh, <laughs> well, so, no, 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 wait, wait a second. I, I did all my graduate work on maternal stress and female outcome. If you have a mother that's anxious, you're getting toxic chemicals uh, right through right. You. Do you. So you're getting poisoned, you're getting shocked, you're feeling all that energy. I knew it was my mother's fault. <laughs> But so what did but, you have to but, then, but then I, I like to take it to one more yeah. like sort of meta step. Yeah. And that's the spiritual meta step that includes the physical. And that says that that soul that is incarnated in that cycle, in that mother, that wound is actually part of that soul's journey. Right. I get it. Like what you have what you have worked through, what you've overcome, this is what you're this is what you came here to do That's right. for the growth of your soul essence. And and to um, to express this to other people. So going through my own liberation, um, it just um, there's nothing else you want to do but inspire other people to be liberated. Mm -hmm. Once you've had it, it's like I can't imagine anything else, any other purpose for being here. Yeah, and it's just your own specific way of expressing it. You know, it's just your, yeah. I think this woman had a question. Thank you for that. Oh. Yeah. Helen, I was wondering if you could speak about OCD. I, I am close with a couple of people that have it, and in particular, the thing that I run up against with them is that they have expressed that they feel that they're dealing with a force that is stronger than they are, so there's no fighting it. It's, it's, and I, at that point, it's hard for me to know what to say. Yeah. Well, um, you, you, like I said, you can invite somebody to go to into a higher state of being, but you can't make them accept the invitation. I've worked with a lot of people with OCD, um, and the brain is telling them they're going to die if they don't do their ritual. Um, now, I had a, a wonderful experience with a young woman that I worked with many years ago who had been a dancer professionally and she had so many injuries she couldn't dance and then she went into the business world where she had a nine, well, well it used to be called a nine to five, but she had a regular job and she said she had to get up two hours earlier um, to do her rituals before she left. And every time you perform a ritual, you're actually strengthening your feeling that you're in danger. So I worked with her in the moment, you know, like she keep checking out reality, keep checking out reality, like, um, and I, I, she was, and her whole family had OCD, it was, you know, so she grew up with it, but I said to her, I gave her a mantra that worked for her, other people are not as quick, I said, say this mantra, my brain is confused, and it thinks I'm in danger when I'm not, if I check out objective reality, I see that I'm safe. And she came on a Tuesday. By Thursday, she said that she cut down her rituals and we just kept working with that. And it, 
and teaching her how to create in herself a sense of safety. But when your brain is telling you that you're going to die, if what if you don't do a like ritual, being what? Like, uh, you know? uh, oh, the ritual. The ritual would be anything by checking the stove ten times. Oh, is and, that a I do that. Not <laughs> <laughs> making sure your door's locked. Making sure. Yeah. Is that a ritual? Well, if you, if you do it more than once, okay. if you're doing it over and over again, as a matter of fact, many years ago, there was uh, one of the special magazine sections in the New York Times about medical advances, and they were just starting brain imaging, and they saw that people who had OCD, and they, and they were just using layman's terms, so you forget, you're not sure if you unplug the iron, you know, so then you get this fear that you set your house on fire, you're walking in the street. Yeah. And then you run up those stairs to check it and then But the fine. person the person the person with O C D, once they have the memory, oh yeah, I unplug the iron, they can remember it. Uh -huh. The the brain doesn't have a mechanism for stopping uh -huh. the thought from recycling. Uh -oh. So even keeps, though they know that even though they know. Uh -huh. And so you have so you need to teach them and you do both behavior modification and then I work with helping them feel safe. But um, and also to, you know, the people I've worked with, to, I mean, I had one woman, I, I forget what the ritual was, something like, if she left some water in a bottle in a refrigerator, she would come home and she'd have this fear, this obsession that somebody had come in and poisoned the water so she could never drink anything that was left in her refrigerator. Well, it's, if you keep throwing out that water, you're reinforcing the, the so you told her to drink the poison water, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if she can, you know, if somebody wants to come in and bring the water, I'll drink it <laughs> first. But, but you, if, if you, if you in, indulge and you follow those, and that's why when you have an obsessive thought, you know, and you're planning and planning where you can't sleep because you're thinking about something you have to do, if you, you can, and you can't stop it. Again, you want to, practice being peaceful, but you also want to thank your brain. I know you're trying to help me. Don't That's fight. That's the positive intent. Don't fight it. There's a woman who goes all over the world because she had the same awareness that I did as a person with many allergies, that allergies are fight and flight responses happening in the body. And if you, if you calm down the fight or flight, you can cure all allergies. <coughs> because, because uh, a peanut protein is not poison, but your body misreads it as poison. Mm. Mm. Does that end? And, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So there, there is a oh, genetic and family aspect to OCD, right? right? Yeah. Have, so it's like reinforced in, in, uh, in, in but, uh, yeah. DNA. And yeah, but the more, and I, I, this one I saw some, some videotapes that you did of people who couldn't function, they were wearing masks because they couldn't breathe, you know, in regular air and every fume. Um, but as, as you calm the whole system down, the, the body is able to, when you're not reactive emotionally, and she uses a lot of the, the kind of work that I do, gratitude, going and creating positive imagery. Now, what we know from live imaging the brain is when they were studying the brain to see where finger movement occurs, what part of the brain is responsible. So they studied pianists and they could see people who played the piano, one part of the brain was larger than the average person. So they asked people, they did a number of experiments, but so one was, imagine you're playing the piano, and they showed them some finger exercises, and they said, just imagine you're doing the finger exercises, and that part of their brain grew bigger. They did another experiment where they had an exercise reg regime, a weight training regime, Half the group did it. They gained 50% muscle mass. Half the group pretended they were doing it, but they visualized, you know, mm -hmm. the curls or whatever. They gained 35% muscle mass. Wow. So now we I know. You don't have to go to the gym. So you don't same. have to. It doesn't matter how long you're doing this. Exercise. Yeah, you have to do it. Yeah, I mean, when they when they were doing the um, the exercise regime, they had a specific. And I just don't know it. Ten minutes of this, ten minutes of this, or whatever. So they just replicated what people actually did with people imagining it. Joe Dispenza talks about this if you look yeah. at his work. But 
Yeah, so but, but we know that the brain doesn't know the difference between imagining doing something and actually doing it. That's why visualizations work so well. Right. Oh, yes, Perks. Uh, hi. Hi, Alan. Um, we actually emailed each other. I'm um, Andy Lapidus. Uh, yes, oh, good. good actually, to from your community that you left. <laughs> okay. Which is interesting because I had similar feelings about that community. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that community. I, very, I, very I have sensibly. a love for it and a hate for it. <laughs> what? I have a love for it and a hate for it. No, I just feel sad, but I. Uh, That's it. Yeah. Well, we don't know what you're talking about. So oh, I right, still so let that. Don't move to my child. I'm a therapist. psychotherapist. Oh, a therapist. I trained in Gestalt therapy. Oh. All at the same institute that Helen trained oh. in. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that, I, that I actually found it, so it was really hard to leave. You it. found it. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. did you have a question? So my question, from a therapist's point of view, <laughs> you might not like this. So she likes it. I trained with Harville Hendricks in Imago therapy. Yeah. Sounds just like the Imago. So I'm a little skeptical. Okay. And what? What? what what's that? What because sounds like Imago? It sounds just like the Imago concept. Which is what? Harville Hendricks. But Hendricks. what is the Imago Getting concept? The you want. What? Getting the love you want. Have you read that book? No. Okay, read it. But what? It's about that unconscious, if you want to call it unaware state, that we look for in a partner. Uh, so that you we carry with us these wounds. Okay. So your question is. How does your concept differ? Oh, because I'm. Because I, 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 I'm. I'm not understanding what you mean by phantom emotion. When I think of phantom, I think of a ghost. It I is a ghost. A, it's not real. The emotions you're feeling are ghosts. They're not real. Okay, but also with the uh, person who has their arm or leg removed, there's something being taken away. No, what are the they reason, still think it's there. The, the reason, no, I, I, let me concept? clarify that point I wanted to make. Okay. It, it, it happens, they found when people had surgery, um, the brain would learn the pain and they would feel it even after they were healed. So they started encouraging people to take, n not to be uh, um, stoic, but take the pain medication because the, so the brain didn't learn it because we now know that after surgeries or injuries, if the brain learned that pain, it may persist in giving us that message that we're in pain even though we have our injury is healed. So, um, so in terms of emotion then, so recognizing that you're not that child and that that you're not helpless and you're not I, I'm um, not a believer in using the word vulnerable. I like the word open. If vulnerable means I'm in danger. So if I open myself up, I, if I open myself up to your loving me, okay. and you and you get critical, uh, no. I don't feel vulnerable. I feel like oh, you know, I might be disappointed. But I'm not vulnerable because I don't walk around needing you mm. to be open to and, re and responsive to me. Right. It, um, unless you had a child. Um, and it's uh, like the phantom emotion of being of being right. vulnerable and helpless. But but when I work with people, um, I work with anything. And I, it doesn't have to be a relationship oriented thing at all. I work with people who have. Um, obsessions about their bodies and symptoms and whatever. So we're always working on what's the positive intent, and then you know. So if it's a fear that um, I'm I'm growing up, I'm leaving home, and I never got the love that I wanted. So I have one person who obsesses about physical symptoms, and like, what's the positive intent? Well, then I can stay with my parents, and they'll take care of me. So. So it's the, the phantom of being the child who needs the caring, even though this is a competent, a, a competent person. So I want to in, encourage him to feel the areas that he's competent in. Otherwise, he will obsess and, and spend lots of money on medical tests when there's nothing there. That makes sense. So it's not, I, I'm, most, people, most people are dealing with fears uh, that about their professional life. And they're not real. And they're not real. And we don't need, you know, we don't need the things that we need to, that we think we need. Going back to that baby, we're all born into a state of peace and love. 
So it's our conditioning, or when we do the spiritual work, we can work on karma and past lives. What we're doing is removing what's ever there that's covering up our natural state of being peaceful and, and being loving, feeling the sun shining on us. So um, it can be a any number of conditioned fears, or again, if you're doing this spiritual work, it can come from karma and past lives, or um, or collective, we, we connect to collective energy, connect, collective images of what aging is like, collective images of how we're supposed to be as a man or a woman. And then we take those things on and we cover up our true nature and then we're never present with who we are, just in the perfection that we are. I just wanted to add that I really liked the concept you talked about earlier about the sensitive man syndrome. I think you should write a book about that. Because okay. it was so interesting. I, you know, I, 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 would, I would love to do more writing, but um, I've been told that I can't get published. <laughs> that uh, what I was told, if you want to get an agent, you have to have a big following because they want they want to do all this digital marketing, and they don't, and so that you need to already have a following. Well, Marissa's even helping. though we've got um, your books over here, the book you already did publish for people to get. It. But yeah, but it, it, I, I was told that it was going to be a hard right, we'll step. How okay. much time? Do, have a book idea. How much time do we have? Here? Um, right now, time check. We've got five, it's five thirty. And how late do we go? So we have until six, and then okay. we can move to the elixir bar to continue the conversation. Yeah, well, oh, so in, in closing, I'd like well, to say. Well, we have to close right now. We have. But I just put, yeah, but I, no, no. <laughs> You're jumping the gun. No, I thought you were going to be in closing. No, <laughs> what I wanted to say is that I know a lot of people are not as comfortable speaking in a group, right. so that we would hang out for a while, and then we could talk more individually and use the time that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, um, I do have books if anybody's interested, because um, it just helps with the concept. It's a very, I think, um, useful self-help approach, but also that um, I'm, because I know that it's sometimes hard to start a process or open up, I'm happy to offer a 15-minute free consultation to anybody who has an issue that they'd like to see what it would be like to explore it in the way that I've described. How could they set up that 15-minute? Helen Kramer. HelenKramer.com. Just, just write in the subject 15 minutes. There's a, there's a form mm -hmm. that, that will get to me. Tracy has a question. Yeah. I wanted to ask if it seems that early on this is where we need to lay down really healthy patterns for children. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit about how we can help children to feel loved and to cultivate these practices early on without sort of boosting their ego. Yeah, and no, I know. I, I, know. Just, I always struggle. I have nieces and nephews, and I want to help them with that. And I don't know if, what practices I can I can. Help yeah, to no, I, I, I know, because it's important to me with the children and has been. Um, one is, you know, a lot of what I say to parents is when, you know, like I had one man who said he changed his work life. He had three kids. So he could come home and have dinner with them and not work late. I said, when you come home and you're talking to your kids, ask them what felt good during the day. And and teach them how to feel good. Like not like when I was saying to woman, my friend did all this wonderful stuff for my birthday, but I don't, there's nothing happening in my body. 